very good morning to all of you welcome back to the channel so we are starting with today's analysis for 21st of july 2023 so firstly we see that supreme court is deeply disturbed and it orders the center and the manipur government to act so recently we saw a sexual assault video which went viral so taking the so motto cognizance of this issue, the court issues ultimatum to the governments to bring perpetrators to book or step aside for it to take action and SG to convey the concern to the center. So using women as instruments of perpetrating violence in a charged atmosphere is simply unacceptable in a constitutional democracy. We direct both the center and the Manipur government to take immediate steps and to apprise the court of the action taken before the next date of listing. So this was something very shocking, which went viral. And immediately we saw that even Prime Minister, he, so, he spoke about this issue and then Supreme Court also issuing orders to both the governments. And apart from this, we have been discussing every day about the developments which are going on. We are basically seeing that situation is getting worse. It is not being handled properly as of now. We are not, we cannot say basically that violence has stopped. So the incidences, they still crop up in between every now and then. So it says that this is the grossest of the constitutional and human rights violations. When we are expressing our deep concern, we will give the government a little time to take action or we will take the action. So if basically uh, the Supreme Court is not satisfied what, uh, what and how government acts, basically what actions are taken and how it reacts to the situation, so Supreme Court would step in. Then Prime Minister again on the same issue, law will act with full might on the guilty and four held in the Manipur sexual assault case. Then as we saw it yesterday, that constitution bench, it will now take up the Delhi government's challenge to center's ordinance on these services. So this is one area which is important for us to understand and what is basically constitution has to say on this, like there was a Supreme Court judgment and after that the central government um, it ordered or it issued an ordinance basically which was countered to the Supreme Court judgment. So that is the whole issue and the issue is between the government of the UT of Delhi and the union government. So here you also need to know about the basics of ordinance its validity and how an ordinance it becomes a law. So these are some of the basic things. And then apart from this, what has been Supreme Court judgments about whether uh, you can basically uh, over reliance on ordinances? Is that acceptable? And how you can understand this, you know, whole issue or whole thing through different case studies of these states in the past because it all started with the state of Bihar when it basically started reissuing the same ordinances and it did not place them before the state legislative assembly. So that is also one of the powers which can be misused by the legislature, sorry, by the state executive. So here we see that executive, it takes into account the legislative powers also and that somewhere violates the constitutional principle of separation of powers between executive and the legislature. So 16 people killed, many are missing as landslip triggered by heavy rain buries a village in the Maharashtra's Raigad. So you can see the scale of disasters which are happening it buries the entire village then again heron comes into picture disaster management so according to different terrains of the states we need to have proper state disaster management plans then if there is any disaster obviously the next step would be the relief measures and rehabilitation if there's a need so that's there So you can, uh, you know, understand this 
Delhi model virtual school. So what are the important and some of the distinct features of it you can basically use in your case studies as well. So here, uh, welcome to the school of future. So what uh, would be some distinct and unique attributes or unique features of the school of future. You can also add up and think about your own points. So key offerings would be that you can get free of course support for the competitive exams with regular test series, study flexible choices of subjects. Uh, it can be a combination of science and humanities. Then you can study different skill courses at your own pace. And you'll also get the opportunity to learn foreign languages. So these are some of the key offerings. So here we have a case study which is related to the culture. So this is basically handicrafted with dignity. So first of its kind initiative is helping women artisans recreate the authentic Pashmina shawls that are making a comeback in the valley. So basically uh, using the conventional techniques, so Pashmina shawls, they give Kashmir its identity and hand spinning of the Kashmiri wool that creates magic. So you can basically read it and you can understand how it can actually help women in, you know, economic sense. And apart from that, revival of this traditional industry would also help the smaller businesses. Apart from that, you know, the cultural significance and all of that begins important. So here we'll talk about that the current draft of the data protection law and the need for refinement, what reforms can be done. So India, it is no Europe and this seems especially true in the face of a task such as drafting and conceptualizing a data protection law for over 1.4 billion Indians. So we often talk about this European Union's GDPR law. So it came into force in mid of 2018 and it achieved widespread popularity as arguably the most comprehensive data privacy law in the world. So this is what it is known for being for being, uh, you know, the most comprehensive law in the world. So that's why you need to understand some of the nitty gritties of this law as well. Then when we talk about this GDPR, it has been saddled with challenges of implementation and the risks being relegated to status of a paper tiger. So there are certain challenges as well when we are talking about GDPR. So although the EU's challenges may be due to its unique legal structure, but India must guard against the risk of enacting a law that is toothless in effect. So issues around the data use when we talk about the data protection law in India. So this deliberation... Uh, becomes increasingly relevant as the Indian government is likely to table the fresh data protection law in the ongoing monsoon session. And late last year, we saw the government to release the digital personal data protection bill for public consultation. So this is the third recent attempt at drafting a data protection law. So before this, we have seen a number of drafts, but they were not, you know, passed and made a law. So let's see whether this attempt, it would be successful or not. So here we see it. 
So while the draft it released for public comments, it was not as comprehensive as its previous versions. News reports suggest that the government may present a bill that is largely similar. So this is one concern. And then another thing, they're considering this critical gap which remains in this bill, it would affect its implementation and the overall success also. So talk about its scope and definition, this bill, it only protects personal data, that is any data that has the potential to directly or indirectly identify an individual. So it only talks about the personal data. So in modern data economy, when we see so much of data generation entities, they use various types of data that includes both the personal and the non-personal data to target, profile, predict, and monitor the users. So what about the non-personal data? So that is uh, like one concern area. Then, for instance, anonymous data sets about the individual Uber rides in New Delhi that can be combined with the prayer timings to identify members who belong to a certain community, which could include their home addresses also. So this process of re-identification of the non-personal data poses significant risk to privacy. So basically, there exists some loopholes, and it has been explained through this example. So limited reach of the data protection board. So another gap is the inability of the proposed data protection board to initiate a proceeding of its own accord. So under this bill, the board, it is uh, the authority that is interested with enforcing the law. So that is going to be the primary function of this board. And it can only institute a proceeding for adjudication if someone affected makes a complaint to it and the government of the court directs it to do so. So only exception to this rule is when the board it can, take action, it can take action on its own to enforce certain duties listed by the bill for the users. Uh, so this is for adjudication of the disputes between the law and the users. So basically more powers can be given to this data protection board as well. Then the Competition Commission of India, which is responsible for the enforcement of India's antitrust law, has the power to initiate the inquiries on its own. So here basically a comparison has been made between CCI and this board. So these are not the only gaps. There are more things to discuss, but uh, it is important to find solutions to them that would help in addressing challenges in its implementation in a significant way and make for a more future-proof legislation. So have we talked about few points and then you can search about some others as well. So a warning on Delhi's projected losses due to climate change is going to be around 2.75 trillion rupees. And a warning comes from the city government's draft action plan on climate change. So it estimates losses from agriculture and allied sectors to be 80 billion rupees from manufacturing would be 330 billion rupees. Services would be the least, uh, it will be the highest, 2.34 trillion rupees. So we see that maximum proportion of the CSR money it goes into the green causes for basically climate change thing. And again, this is one of the limitations when we talk about spending of CSR funds. We need to ensure that it is diversely spent across different sectors where we feel the need it should be spent and not just be concentrated in you know one area. So let's understand this Kerch Bridge attack. So talking about the recent attack which was done by Russia. So here we have the map of the region as well. So why was this attack significant? So firstly, let's understand the geography around it. So in this map, you can see this is Crimea. Here it is Black Sea, the Sea of Azov. So Crimea it was annexed by Russia in 2014. Here we have Ukraine and here it is Russia. So here, this region is known as the Kerch Strait, which is connecting Black Sea and the uh, Sea of Azov. All right, then this is the bridge we're talking about, and that's how it looks. So the road bridge, it temporarily closed. Russia attacks carried out by the uh, drones 
underwater. So this is the Kurt Strait, and in between you have the Taman Bay. So why is this bridge so important? So bridge is important for Russia for the symbolic, administrative, and operational reasons. And when Russia it swiftly moved to annex Crimea in 2014 after a pro-Russian elected government in Kyiv, it fell amid the West-backed anti-regime protests. There was no direct connectivity between the Russian mainland and Crimea. So this bridge basically connects Russia's mainland and Crimea. So Mr. Putin, he immediately ordered construction of this bridge. But this bridge, it remained a weak link as Ukraine, it grew in the military, uh, military strength. And apart from this, it connects basically the importance is that it, it is connecting the Russia's mainland with Crimea. So one of the key goals of the Ukrainian counteroffensive was to destroy this bridge, cutting off Russia from Crimea, and it also wants to disrupt the Russian supplies to southern Ukraine, which is the focal area. And so that's why Ukraine, it attacks this bridge. But so far, Ukraine, it has not taken the responsibility for the attack. So these are some of the developments. So you can um, basically understand the role of NHRC, the National Human Rights Commission, regarding the gang rape case of Manipur. So firstly, you need to identify the different stakeholders. So this was the NHRC's first public statement about the human rights violations in Manipur since the violence began. So it issued its first public statement and in a statement, it said that it had taken cognizance of May 4 incidents and where a mob of 1,000 people had abducted five members of the Kukizo family while they were being escorted to safety by the Manipur police. So despite the presence of police, such incidents occurred. So that's highly unfortunate. And the mob even killed two people, two men who tried to protect those women. So commission said that it had taken up this case based on complaints that sought its urgent intervention. So it notices uh, issued to the Manipur chief secretary and the director general of police, it has sought detailed action taken reports within four weeks. So commission would also like to know about the steps taken or proposed to be taken to safeguard human rights of the citizens, especially the women in the vulnerable sections of society from such barbaric incidents. So again, in Project Cheetah, when we see that five of them have already died, so Supreme Court, it urges the center to transfer those chief jails to another location. So this has been the most important concern that uh, all the cheetahs, they have been put in and they've been brought to the Kuru National Park in Madhya Pradesh. So why all of them at one place is the main question. And it is being deliberated that is that the reason that we are seeing that cheetahs are not able to survive and sustain in that environment. So Supreme Court has also taken up this issue and told the union government that death of 40% of the 20 cheetahs brought from South Africa and Namibia, uh, within a year, it does not present a good picture. So eight cheetahs dying out of a total 20. So eight have died. I'm sorry, I said five. Eight have died out of 20 brought a hair in just one year does not present a good picture and last week alone two have died so you should look at other possibilities like you can transfer them to another 
uh, location, irrespective of which state government is running them. So why are you making this a prestige issue? So this is what the court had to say. So center, it bans the export of non-Basmati white rice to control the price rise in India. So this is one of the steps which can be taken up by the government in order to ensure that the uh, basically the we do not see the incidence of cereal inflation going up. So if you ban the export, basically you try to ensure that there is adequate amount of domestic supply in the markets and we don't see the incidences of supply disruption, which can cause inflation to go up. Coming to the world page, so here we see US sanctions people and businesses linked to the Wagner in Africa. So you need to know clearly about the Wagner group, its you know, link or the relationship with Russia and the past role of Wagner group also becomes important in different wars. So you can just find out about these things. So we see that Wagner and Belarus military, they train together. So basically it is believed that Wagner group uh, it has its headquarters in Belarus. So even the geography from the perspective of map work also becomes important. You can look about the countries which borders Belarus. So mercenaries from Russia's military company Wagner, they launched joint drills with the Belarus military near the border with Poland following their relocation to Belarus after their short-lived rebellion. And that was a move that prompted Warsaw to redeploy its troops. So a statement from China that China does not want a trade war with the US. So it does not want a trade war with the US but will retaliate against any further US restrictions on technology and trade. So you can basically think that how a trade war between US and China can impact India or what uh, are some of the concerns like why US, what are the reasons why US is imposing restrictions on the things and the items specifically from the perspective of technology and national security, they are being imposed by US and should India also go for that or not? So here, uh, that is the dimension which can be connected with India. So on the business page, we see. So US indicator points to recession starting soon. So as of now, we expected uh, as per the data that we had for different indicators and the performance of different economies, that it might be possible that, uh, you know, we might not see a uh, very serious level of recession, but we were expecting it could be of, uh, we can say, milder intensity. But right now, again, the concerns are again rising about recession. So an index which is designed to track turns in the U.S. business cycle, it fell for the 15th straight month and it dragged down by a weakening consumer outlook and increased unemployment claims. So we see that an ad hoc panel has been directed, basically ad hoc panel directed to explain what are the reasons for exempting Vinesh Fogart and Bajrang Punia from the trials. So without trials, their selection comes under question. 
and the Delhi High Court, uh, it asked the ad hoc panel running the affairs of the WFI to explain reasons for exempting the top wrestlers from Asian Games trials. So they were given direct entry for the Asian Games by the Indian Olympic Association's ad hoc committee. And now that comes the basis for selection, the question of fair selection comes into the question and it comes into the picture basically. So on the science page, accidental drowning, basically restraint and awareness at the water's edges can help. So World Drowning Prevention Day, it's on 25th of July, and it's an attempt to study the subject and implement various expert advisories on the safe spaces. And in 2021, we saw 36,000 drowning deaths reported over children were a large number. So talking about the global situation, so children, they are at high risk. So it's important to keep them safe. Creation of safe space, that is also an important thing and it can also help in prevention of such incidences. Then you can go ahead with barricading, awareness generation and flood casualties can also be prevented. So key aspect in the drowning deaths or children are the lack of supervision and the physical barriers on the water bodies. So that needs to be the simple steps which can be taken and that can bring a huge difference. Coming to Mint newspaper, so here we talk about chat GBT or we can say artificial intelligence. So is chat GBT turning dumb because we see that only 2.4% is the score in maths. So these are also some of the concerns when we talk about artificial intelligence that the longer period sustainability of such technology and over reliance on their usage because then we see that it was believed that they are more you know efficient it would save time and specifically for the corporates so you need to first think that can we over rely or can we even you know just simply rely on such technology or not so forget about over reliance so according to its performance uh, we see that over the last two to three months many chat gpt users they have been complaining of a drop in its performance so its performance and behavior comes under question So how is open AI reacting to this controversy? So first you need to know about the difference between open AI, generative AI, and the basic things that is, this is a very important topic. So reacting to user criticism, uh, the vice president of open AI, which owns chat GPT said that GPT-4, it was getting smarter with each new version. And when you use it more heavily, you start noticing issues you didn't see before. So we are actively looking into the reports people shared. So this is. So what does it mean for the users and the companies? Again, that's the same thing. We can't over rely on such types of technologies. So there is no basically alternative to hard work or smart work. So Prime Minister's statement on the Manipur incident says that the incident from Manipur it, that has come to the fore, it is shameful for any civil society and the law will take its strongest steps with all its might and what happened to the daughters of Manipur can never be forgiven.
in the Financial Express. Let's see some of the new topics. So the role of Japan in India's development process and the investments that it is making or we are still deliberating upon becomes important. So here we see that uh, it may invest around 5 trillion yen in India. So we had a very detailed discussion about the common strategies that we can develop in terms of the path forward exchange of better practices and exchange of the new technology. So Japanese investment in India, which would be close to 5 trillion yen over the next few years, not only in the steel sector, but other sectors as well. So in terms of bullet train or even, you know, when we talk about the Silver Line project, which is also in news because of the protests by the environmental experts, even there, Japan is ready to make some investment in that project. So TRI, it proposes the AI regulation on use case basis. So it suggests setting up of an independent statutory body for the regulation. So regulated use of this technology is important and it poses high risk to human lives. So in its recommendations to the government, telecom and broadcasting regulators said that such AI technology should be regulated through creation of an independent statutory authority which can be named as artificial intelligence and data authority of india whose task should be to ensure development of responsible ai and regulation of the use cases so right now we just talked about the poor performance or the falling performance of chat gpt so a regulated use that becomes important and even from the perspective of data safety and security there also the regulation will play an important role then again india japan you can see they signed a pact for chip development so semiconductor is an important area so two countries will establish an implementation organization to decide on how we'll be collaborating we talked about the export ban on non-basmati white rice and so you can see our reliance on the imported crude oil rises to 88.3%. So this is not a good signal. We are trying to ensure that our over-reliance on the imports for crude oil, it gets diversified firstly in terms of the countries on which we are dependent and then diversified in the sense that we are able to, you know, generate domestic capacity for the renewable energy. So this would somewhere uh, help India strengthen its economic resilience also. And as our dependence would reduce on imports, so that would somewhere reduce the volatility as well. And even in terms of the BOP also, this would be uh, an important thing. So we see that fuel consumption has increased, but the output has reduced. So we can say that demand is increasing, but supply has fallen. So this would result in increased prices for the crude oil. So that is not good for our BOP account. Coming to Indian Express newspaper. So, again, from Manipur police, they were with the mob and they left us with those men, says woman who was stripped and raped. So, police basically could not save them. That's again, very unfortunate thing. 
and a day after a video of two women from the kuki zomi community they were being paraded naked and sexually assaulted in manipur surfaced on social media one of the victims told that they had been left to the mob by the police so who is actually accountable in this manipur incidents so only way to deliver justice to the survivors of this mob assault and to stabilize manipur is to ensure accountability so such polarized politics is driven by complex structures of silence around it and silence that screams the loudest is that of india's prime minister so he's finally and belatedly spoken on manipur as has the chief justice of india but for a figure as dominant and communicative as a prime minister to make not make a single sentence on manipur's predicament so far and the inability of the powerful home minister to control the situation raises questions of where exactly the ruling party figures on the complicit incompetent spectrum in manipur so basically this is more of political in nature so that's why i'll not go into this So, Arum Sharmila, even she writes on this issue of uh, this incidents of Manipur. So, she said that I feel helpless when I see the news. So, inhuman assault on women in Manipur brings deeper issues to the fore. So, actually, the ground situation is very intense and it's very volatile. We can't basically even imagine what would have been, you know the actual situation there and even right now what is the actual situation in the state so it's like we can't see any law and order like situation as of now in the state so she feels helpless when i see the news and with their act of humiliating others and sexual assault what were the perpetrators trying to achieve So tomato prices has become such a big issue that we're talking about tomatonomics. So the paradox about it, so prices of tomato, they are sky high and yet the inflation rate of the tomato prices, that is negative. So why is the reason? So also the costly tomatoes, they are an annual complaint. So this happens every year. And the reason is that it's seasonal in nature. So government's response, that is also same every year. Basically, we're not trying to find a solution to this problem. So what else can be done? So an interesting trend is that prices are going up, but inflation is still in the negative territory. So that would be obviously because of the figures. So that is something statistical. And we can just look at 
basically what can be the solution basically we discussed this yesterday as well so problem every year india does have a problem with tomato prices and it strikes consumers every single year and here we having the data from 2010 and the timing of this incidence so more or less you can see it's in june and july of late so every year the response of the government that also remains the same and this is a they say that this is a temporary problem prices they will come down when the supply improves so this time too the response remains the same and we also talked about that it is grown in which all states so several things can be done to avoid such annual spikes so the most important is to boost the india's ability to store the produce so as to ensure that the supply is not disrupted so we need to work upon the storage infrastructure and the ability to store excess produce will not only help consumers during such phases when the supply slumps, but it will also help the farmers earn better. So that's because a second set of reports uh, by the Indian Express and other news organizations relates to farmers dumping their produce after a bumper harvest. So this is also a common picture that we get to see. So we'll be able to prevent both of these things through this single step. So why will Putin not go to South Africa for the BRICS summit? So the significance is that a difficult situation has been resolved for South Africa, which would have been theoretically obligated to arrest Putin for alleged war crimes if he had arrived in its jurisdiction. And why is the obligation to arrest Putin? So on 17 March, the ICC, it had issued warrants of arrest for two individuals in the context of situation in Ukraine. So Mr. Vladimir uh, Putin and Mr. Miss Maria. So ICC headquartered in Hague, Netherlands is an independent judicial body that began functioning in 2002 to prosecute the most heinous offenses where a country's own legal machinery failed to act, like in case of Rwanda and Earthwell. Yugoslavia. So unlike ICJ, which is International Court of Justice, which deals with countries and the interstate disputes, so ICC prosecutes individuals. So it investigates and where warranted, it tries the individuals charged with the gravest crimes of concern to the international community. So that is the basic difference between ICC and ICJ. And South Africa, it has said that it is neutral in the war in Ukraine, but as a member of ICC, it is in the theory obligated to execute the warrant for arrest. So Mr. Putin, he would have, you know, attended or he would have agreed to attend this break summit in South Africa. So South Africa would have to arrest him. So the question comes that does the ICC have the authority to prosecute Putin or not? So Russia has repeatedly said that it does not have the authority and Russia is not one of the 123 states parties uh, to the Rome statute that recognize the authority of ICC. So since Russia is not a party to it, so that's why ICC cannot act against Mr. Vladimir Putin. So United States, China and in India too do not recognize the ICC's jurisdiction. And even Ukraine, it is not a state party to Rome statute. So in 2014, it accepted jurisdiction of the court over the alleged crimes committed on its territory. So we've already seen these things. So we see sustained foreign institutional investors inflows and global crews make it takes markets to new highs. So in India, we seeing the capital market or the share market making new high every day. That is because one of the main reasons can be that globally, when we talk about the performance in other economies, even in the developed world, that is not so promising. And India, in the current situation, we offer a very positive picture We um, when we talk about the economy's resilience. And even the indicators, they are showing that we are growing uh, like 
at a stronger rate and we are like going strong. So that is one of the reasons why uh, even the foreign investors, they are again investing huge amount of their money in the Indian capital market. So that is one of the main reasons why we are seeing a bullish market in India right now. So that's all for today and thank you so much for joining us in this analysis session. I hope you have understood the topics that we have taken up today and do subscribe to the channel if you haven't and also hit the like button for the video.